Moving on, just uh, apologies from to the technical team at Saxonburg. <laughs> <laughs> we're great at making wines, but clearly we're not going to start a tech company anytime soon. So we were set up. We had, I think we'd done a number of dry runs and then obviously we messed it up on the day. So, but I see you're all flooding in nicely. So that's really good. There's 24 of you ready. Um, Thanks, Fred. Thanks, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> you should you should wait for us to uh, to taste it, but uh, we'll let you off. I'm cheating. Taste it ahead. Good man. Good man. Okay. I think I think we're good to go. So, and also in the interest of everyone's time, a big welcome uh, on behalf of Saxburg, Dirk, and myself to our very first um, virtual wine launch. So this is exciting for us. Of course, we would prefer to sit in a room with you or to um, host you here at Saxonburg, but uh, I think this is a wonderful way for us to share it. Um, all of you should have received the wines uh, over the last few days. And just a quick heads up, in terms of the order, we'll be tasting first the winemaker's blend, followed by our 2020 Sauvignon Blanc, followed by the Sauvignon Semillon, and then last but not least, the Chardonnay 2019. So um, again, just uh, thank you for all, to all of you for indulging us uh, with your time. We know it's a, a busy and a crazy uh, period that we are going through. It's pretty busy on our side as well. Um, and uh, so, so we'll, uh, we'll try and make it as efficient for everyone as possible. Dirk and I have spent the last 10 minutes geeking out about his uh, latest uh, fascination in the wine cellar, which is submerged cap on our Syrah. And I will talk about that when those wines get released. So um, don't want to give too much away. But on a serious note, I'm very happy, very proud to sit here with uh, Dirk today. Um, many of you have visited us over the last few days, weeks, uh, and also pre-pandemic. And we've really enjoyed sharing our story with you. We are on a rather ambitious uh, journey. Uh, we have a big vision and it is our mission to really bring justice to this place that we call home, this incredible farm, this terroir and this place where my family and the Saxonburg family um, and obviously they overlap in uh, pretty much every way, um, you know, have really tried for the last 30 years to do special things and wonderful things. And we're excited to keep doing those um, also in this generational change. Um, Saxonburg is all about family and obviously a leading part uh, in that uh, theatrical display is by Dirk van Sale, who joined us at uh, the end of 2019 and who actually started officially as winemaker at Saxonburg on the 1st of December 2019. Um, Dirk and I met halfway through 2019 yeah, a and bit, just a little bit after halfway, probably. Exactly, and we had a we had a chat that went on for about an hour. I think we could have easily uh, gone on for a lot longer, and um, it was one of those moments where I was sort of quietly happy, but couldn't give it away that I knew we had found the right person, the right individual um, who was passionate enough, and clearly, um, as time will hopefully show today as well. Um, I'm convinced of it, more than talented enough um, to really help us on this, uh, on fulfilling this, uh, this vision. Um, I'm very, very happy and proud to be here today as he unveils his first flight of his maiden vintage whites here at Saxonburg. Um, and without too much further ado, I will hand over to Dirk to talk to you about these, his wines, um, the Saxonburg wines here today. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, of course, there won't be any open dialogue, unfortunately, because we've set it up as a webinar. Uh, it'll be fairly, fairly informal. So we're going to talk through the, the wines, the order that I mentioned before. And then I will keep an eye on the screen. You can engage either by raising your hand, um, by leaving a comment, and we will make sure of every wine to engage with uh, all the questions that are being asked. So um, I think we're predicting sort of a 60 uh, to 80 minute uh, webinar, uh, depending on how many questions we get. 
So uh, yeah, exciting. Let's let's get going. Over to Great. you. Well, thanks, Vincent. Yeah, and I think uh, thank you just from me on a personal note. Thanks for everyone joining. It's a it's quite a big day in in, in my career. I've been you know winemaking has been my life basically from the start. I grew up on a wine farm, so that's all I've ever wanted to do. So to to get the opportunity to finally release my own wines is it's a pretty great day. Um, and and we're picking. We're harvesting and everything, so you know I couldn't have asked for a for a for a better day. Um, so yeah, thanks for for being part of that, and hopefully uh, you guys will enjoy the wines, and hopefully you, you will get to get a sense and a, and a feel for for the direction we want to take Saxonburg in, um, and and the clarity that we want to bring um, through our wines. Um, so without spending too much time about talk, let's let's jump into the wine. So you tell me when you want me to put up the map. I will. So so the first wine is our winemaker's blend now this is winemaker's blend 2020 this is a special small little bottling just over 500 bottles made and this is just for our wine club um, and vincent and i have been been chatting you know obviously with everything that happened in in 2020 we've we've just seen how important it is to really engage with our customers directly and to those direct sales and you know build relationships with our customers and and then we came up with this idea of of making a wine, blending a wine that truly showcases everything Saxonburg has to offer. So incorporating all of the wines we have on the farm and doing it as a special release um, for our wine club. And for me, when I, when I blended this wine, I really, the whole time I had this thought in my head that I wanted to create something that is not one cultivar overshadowing another. So really trying to seamlessly integrate all the cultivars together. And then a lot of the wines in the last year or two that has inspired me a lot, especially white wines, have been wines that are, you know, doesn't shout their presence to you. They, they don't, you know, there's not one factor that screams at you, but they're almost more nuanced. And to maybe to an untrained palate, the wines can almost seem a little bit too unassuming. Um, but if you really look at those wines, they are so filled with depth and character and texture and, and balance and those wines, you know, that's what I strive to, to do as a winemaker is to bring texture and balance in and to really showcase um, the terroir. So as we go on terroir, Vincent, maybe go onto the onto the slides. Okay, don't, so, don't, don't be distracted. If, uh, <laughs> I'm just keeping up with the, the comments here a little bit as well. And since we are recording this to distribute afterwards, um, just making sure that we're doing a good job here. Okay, so we'll be sharing the first map. Go. So over here we've got, so I, we did a, a whole GIS study on the farm um, a little bit, well, halfway through last year and, and Vinpro does a brilliant job of it. And it's really, I, I would encourage any, any wine farmer to really do it. it is, it's a fantastic tool to have. So over here you have basically a map of Saxonburg. Um, just to orientate yourself, the gate to Saxonburg is basically at the bottom left corner. Um, and this is, these are the aspects. You will see Saxonburg, we're really lucky that we have everything from south, west, up to north. The only thing that we don't really have on the farm is east facing slope. So we've really got a whole range. We cover that, the, the Polkadry Hill beautifully. Um, and that really gives us a, a beautiful range of, of terroirs and of, of microclimates. And you can see the blend. We've, we've pinpointed the, the blocks that we use for this blend. So this blend is 51% Chenin Blanc. It's 30% um, Chardonnay, 14% Semillon, and 5% Sauvignon Blanc. And so maybe if we go on to the next slide. And this is the really interesting one. So this shows solar radiation. Um, and solar radiation is basically the amount of energy that that, that part of Earth receives from the sun. Um, so it's correlated to temperature. It's not directly linked to temperature because temperature is influenced by proximity to the sea and factors like that as well. Um, but if you look at where the Chenin Blanc is, it's a relatively warmer spot. Um, so it ripens quite early, ripens quite beautifully. It's a weak granitic soil where it's planted. Um, we picked that Chenin Blanc relatively ripe, not, not, not crazy ripe, and then it went to older barrels. So it was fermented in old two to five liter barrels. And if I'm saying old, I really mean old. It's about, the, I think the barrel was about 10 years old. And I mented it in a barrel, naturally fermented, so no yeast to add it to it. And then it stayed in that barrel on the lees for 10 months. The Chardonnay, that's a small little block that was planted in 1993. And it's a, this unassuming block as you drive in right below our parking area, actually. 
on very sandy soil and I picked it very, very early because the, the soil dry, dries out so quickly. I had to, I had to pick it really, really early. Um, so that wine after ferment had an alcohol of, of just over 12% and a massive acidity, like a beautiful acidity. Um, and I love having components uh, in the cellar that has have these high acids and that I can leave because that enables me because of the low pH to leave it in barrel without any sulfur. And um, so that component stayed in barrel, also in an old two to five liter barrel um, for the entire 10 months without receiving a drop of sulfur. So we just routinely, we, we routinely topped up the barrel and eventually the barrel went through malolactic fermentation as well. So that really added to the texture of the Chardonnay. Then uh, next up is the Semio, and that's from right at the top of the farm. You'll see at the top right-hand corner almost, it's 14% Semio on the bank. And that block is high up, so it's, it's quite cool, even though it receives quite a bit of sunlight. Um, but this also went into an old two to five liter barrel, um, and then it was left without sulfur as well. So same as the Chardonnay, really left this wine alone, just left it on the leaves. We stirred up the leaves quite a few times and to really bring out that, that waxy, you know, richness of, of, of Semillon. Um, and that was the component that we were looking for there. And then there's a 5% Sauvignon Blanc on a really cool little spot that gives beautiful minerality, beautiful freshness, high acid to the wine. And that 5% was just, you know, bumped up. You don't want to put too much Sauvignon Blanc in it because it's, you know, it's such an aromatic variety that you almost, you don't want to mask anything, any of the other varieties with it, but it just brought that, that hint of freshness that you needed um, in the wine. And then you can just maybe go to the next one, Vincent, just the, just the last on the terroir. So another interesting one, this is, these are daylight hours. So you can really see how, you know, the Chardonnay at the bottom received by far the most amount of, of daylight. And then as you move up to the farm and, and the more on the Southwestern slopes, right at the top of the Sauvignon Blanc, much less daylight. So the less daylight it receives, obviously the longer it takes to ripen, the cooler it generally is and all of that. So it's, it's really important to look at all of these aspects, um, you know, when, when planting, the farm and then i mean this is a such a critical tool that we're using now on our on our replanting program uh, but it also you know gives lots of insights into understanding why the wines show the way they do um so yeah let's have a taste let's have a taste um maybe just uh well yeah you, you mentioned it now already and uh, you said in the beginning on a on a commercial side um i think what's what's quite interesting is is that we you know when, when dirk and i had the early discussions around the winemaking and the style, there is, there is an inherent sort of obviously Saxonburg DNA. And, you know, the idea is always to pursue that. Uh, and I suppose that DNA really is reflective of what our terroir is here, which as you can see is, is very diverse. And we've, we brought all these tools on that are just allowing us to make so many more informed decisions. Um, and as much as we want to be creative and adventurous and we'd love to plant the farm to 25 different varieties, um, we're very strict about obviously sticking to what we know works really well, which is our Syrah, um, obviously blocks of Cab. We have a little bit of Pinotage, as you know, on the reds and then on the whites, it's always been Sauvignon and Chardonnay. And now we've got Chenin and, and Semillon as well, to some extent. Um, we will be doing a few trials here and there, but the idea of the winemakers blend and what you know, whatever it, it ends up being every year, and in those years that we produce it, is to allow the winemaker creative freedom to to play around with those parcels that are too small to yeah. to to really produce on a commercial um, uh, volume, and and also to see what else we can do uh, and on the farm. And so, yeah, very excited about this one. Yeah, I think just to to tag to touch onto that almost, or to add on to that. I, I feel it's crucial as a winemaker to always every year experiment to, to an extent. Obviously not experiment with your with the biggest tanks in the, you know, but but having experiments on the side is it 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 forces you to push the envelope a little bit. It forces you to think outside of the box and, and to get outside of your comfort zone. Because I think it's so dangerous, you know, it's so easy to fit fall almost into a recipe year after year after year. Oh, this has worked well. And then 10 years down the line, you look back and you're, you know, there's so much that you've missed out on, so much potential that you've missed. So, so for me, it's really with all of these little components, uh, it's, it's a barrel here or a barrel there. And, you know, some of them might not work, but some of them might work beautifully. And it's really that just 
you know, stretches my mind a little bit. And, and next year I know, oh, you know, I made that barrel like this and this worked really well. And that then might seep into, you know, our more commercial or the more, more commercial wines as well. Um, so that's, that's the, you know, I think what the great avenue is to have something like this to, to be I mean, able to a, a, another addition, and I always have to play the, the more commercial <laughs> person in this uh, duo is that, um, you know, we, we've really been working very hard on finding ways to reward the, the loyalty of our customers, our end consumers, ultimately, wherever they are in the world. And um, so one of those has been to, to, to reformulate, rebuild a wine club that goes beyond just offering wines on pre-release, um, access to all the vintages, but to really, you know, offer them the, the truly limited stuff that we play with here as well. And to say, you know, we can go this extra step if you're part of our inner circle, you know, and we want to reward the fact that you're curious and interested and come back year after year after year. So this has also been, I guess, another sort of um, motivation behind uh, this, uh, this particular project. So cool. well, let's test it. Let me just uh, check if we have any questions that have come up. It's amazing. I've, I've, so I poured this wine uh, about 10, 15 minutes before before we start, and it's amazing to see how it opens up in the glass. And I'm I'm quite happy about that. It's always I feel it's a good sign when the wine you know develops beautifully in the glass. Okay, I think we can do that for later. So cool. So if you've got if if anyone has any questions on the wine, um, anything you would like to add, just I see uh, Michael, uh, welcome. Great to have you uh, on with us. Um, so members pay 185 Rand for this uh, bottle of wine, uh, which we've limited, well, the limit of production was 500 and help me out, 58? 526 bottles. 526 bottles. At any stage, love that this is. So the red, <laughs> Fred, a uh, good question. Yes, there is a blend in the making, but that's all we can say for now. It may not be a winemaker's blend, it may be something else, <laughs> let's see. Fred, we, we, we don't plan these things too long in advance. It's, it's almost, these wines are created by, I think, inspiration almost at the moment, so in the moment. So, you know, I, like when I started, I said to Vincent, listen, I'm always gonna experiment. We're always gonna have some weird and wonderful wines, hopefully in, in, in the cellar. And if they're viable, then, then we can do something with it. So, you know, on, on the red, I'm, I've definitely had a few projects and we've got a few barrels and there might be something that, you know, if, if we feel it's worthwhile, we'll put it together and, and we'll bottle it. If, if not, then so be it. Um, so I, we can't make any promises. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Now you've become the commercial guy. And I, um, okay. And then the, the price, uh, Fred, it's 185. 185 per bottle. Delicious wine. Yeah, that's a, that's a, so we've just had the comment that these wines evolve over time. I think that's an inherent trait of so many great wines. They just need a little bit of time to, to breathe. Is, is the RS result of the natural ferment or subsequent blend or was the tweet once blend completed? There was no tweaking on this. So, so no added acid to it, uh, no RS added to it. I try and, you know, keep it as, as pure as possible or pure an expression of the terroir and of the vintage as possible. Um, so if I if I can get away without adding anything, I don't, and it's because it's, you're completely correct, mostly because of the natural ferment um, that we had a bit of residual um, that stuck. And I mean, that's in, in, in some vintages you get it, and some some you don't, and it's generally quite a bit of fructose that that stays over, especially on on your natural yeast. They they struggle sometimes to convert a lot of or, or, or ferment a lot of fructose. So they keep a bit of fructose over and that gives a lovely fruit sweetness to, to the wine as well and balances the acidity I find quite beautifully. Uh, then we've had another question. What is the max amount of bottles per wine club member? Um, as much as we haven't fixed a number of bottles per person, we do obviously um, make sure that everyone who has an interest gets the, the wine club box. So at the moment we're limiting, we will probably be limiting it to three bottles per person and it will be released on the 25th of March. You're setting them, yes. <laughs> yes, he is. Thanks, Fred. <laughs> All right, so I think we've had a lot of good I, questions. Yeah. I, I think just to, to make a point as well, because it's, uh, 
I mean, Salzburg has, has always been known for its reds, and I think you know that that's what most people attribute to Salzburg as, as Shiraz or Syrah and Cab, and and rightfully so. And I think today we just want to showcase, you know, we are in the Pogoda Hills, and it's such a special spot. This, and we're we're so close to the ocean that it really is such a unique terroir that can produce beautiful wines, uh, white wines as well. And and I think what, what shines through, hopefully, in all the wines you'll taste this afternoon is that minerality and that freshness. Um, you know, even if you bring in lots of texture and richness to the wine, there's still a minerality and a purity to the whites um, that I think is, is very special. And so even though, you know, the focus is, is still very much on reds and it, and it always will be, um, this is just, it's a nice opportunity to show the versatility of the, th the farm, I think. We have a last question, Dalian. <laughs> Welcome, great to have you with us as well. Um, well, we can talk about <laughs> Port of Port getting a bottle when you come and visit us tomorrow. How about that? We might have to both close our eyes for, for a minute or two. And, uh, and, and, but don't leave with more than one. <laughs> Good. Okay, um, are you happy to move yeah, on let's, to the we, next one? We can move on. Okay, so our next one is um, the 2020 Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and there's a few changes to, to this wine from, from the 2019. Uh, so the first is you'll see it is now in a, in a burgundy bottle. It has for the last 30 years been yep. in, a, in a claret yep. bottle, yep. Um, bottled under cork. And now it's under bur in, in a burgundy bottle and under screw cap. Um, and I, I must say, I, I pushed quite a bit for the, <laughs> for the screw cap. I just think with, with Sauvignon Blanc and, you know, you want to keep that, that freshness in, in the wine. And at this, the price point that we're selling it at, there's no oak on it. I think it just makes a, a lot of sense. And I think it's also, you know, the style of the wine um, the, lends more towards it, the burgundy bottle. Definitely. Um, so onto, onto the wine. So we've got quite a bit of Sauvignon Blanc planted on the farm. And, and what makes Saxonburg Sauvignon Blanc so unique, and for me personally, um, it, it, it's quite different to other Salamosh Sauvignon Blancs. Um, if, if you taste this in a lineup, I think, I, I think most people won't spot it as Stalamor Sauvignon Blanc and probably more a cooler climate Sauvignon Blanc. And the reason for that is we're about 14 Ks from False Bay um, with nothing in between. I mean, it's Cape Flats from us to the ocean, basically. Um, and then the really unique factor about our side of the hill is that we've got uh, Table Bay only about 23 kilometers away. So we really have the ocean front from both sides. And we've got those cooling breezes from both sides. And as you drive up the hill, it's quite... It's quite interesting and I, I've seen it often now during harvest when I do a lot of sugars in, in the vineyards. You leave, I leave the cellar here and it's quite, quite warm. And when I get to the top of the, the farm, right at the top of some of your blunt blocks, it's almost, I almost need to put a jacket yeah. on um, just because of that breeze coming off of the ocean continually and it really cools it down. And it gives us combined with the, the decomposed granite that we've got on the farm, it really gives beautiful minerality and, and fantastic acidities, especially in these last two vintages. I, last year, I went on about the lovely natural acidity and this year, it's e even more. So it's, it's really fantastic. Maybe just go on to the-, the Do you want to tell them what temperature you, you harvested the, gra the, the grapes arrived? In oh the yeah, so, 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 so we, we do a lot of our Sauvignon Blanc with, with a machine harvester and a lot of people, you know, don't, a lot of people pick with machines, but not a lot of people necessarily say that they pick with machines. And, but it's, it's quite interesting with Sauvignon Blanc um, because we get everything from the, from the farm and the biggest risk generally with machine harvested grapes are the transport. So it's not the fact that they, they're harvested by machine, but it's the transport from the vineyard lot to the cellar where there's, because there's a lot of juice, the transfer oxidation is, is so much more. Um, I mean, we're, our transport takes us maybe five minutes from the, from the block to get to the cellar. We add a, a little bit of sulfur in the vineyard as well to protect it. But the, the machine really allows us to come into the, the vineyard early in the morning when it's nice and cool. And I mean, I've, I've had days or, or mornings this year where we were picking Sauvignon Blanc and they were coming into the winery at 12 degrees Celsius which is absolutely fantastic. I mean, that's, that's absolutely brilliant. You basically don't have to put the switch cooling on almost in the cellar for that. Um, so that really, that's, that's so crucial in, in the quality of, of the Sauvignon Blanc. If you look at the map, you'll see a lot of the, most of the Sauvignon Blanc plantings are concentrated on the south and southwest facing slopes. So you'll see those red, um, those red blocks, which is where this blend was from, but all of the basically adjoining blocks to them as well are also Sauvignon Blanc. 
um, and I use maybe go to the next one. Then on on the solar radiation, um, you'll see there's a block right at the bottom, uh, or well midway in the farm. Um, it's a smaller block. It's a slightly warmer site. It's it, that is at about 160 meters elevation. Elevation. Um, so I get really beautiful tropical flavors from that block. And then if you go higher up that road, and you'll see to the to the lower kind of radiation areas there, you get beautiful. Uh, minerality and you get those those green flavors or the metoxypyrazines that if you you know that's attributable to to cooler climate um, and it's really for me the combination when making this wine is really to bring in the combination of both i don't want to i know there's a, a large movement away from green flavors and people it's almost a swear word if you say metoxypyrazines to some people but i think if, if if i weren't including any of those wines into the final wine it would not be true to Saxonburg. It would not be true to Tewa. Um, so for me, it's really about finding the balance and to really showcase the site as well as I can. Um, so this is all stainless steel fermented. Um, most of the, well, all of these components receive skin contact, um, about 80% of them, 24 hours on the skins. And I, I can do that because of the beautiful acidities we have. Um, in lower acid years, I tend to do less skin contact because you quite you drop out quite a bit of acidity. Um, but in, in high acid years, you really can leave it on the skins and it gives you, brings an extra dimension to the wine, I feel. It brings extra texture, extra flavor, um, and it's, it's really important to me. So then fermenting in tank, as I said, relatively cool fermentation. And then after ferment, I leave it on the grow sleeves. Uh, so a lot of people tend to wrap off quite early after ferment off the grow sleeves and just leave it on the fine leaves. I like to leave it on the grow sleeves. So this was on the grow sleeves for, for about six months. Um, on some of the components, I would do a bit of batonage in tank almost. You can't really call it batonage, but we would stir the tank up a little bit. And that's really to keep the leaves in suspension. Um, and because of the minerality and, and the acidity that we get in our wines, I really want to, you know, round and coat that acidity on us. So bring in a bit of texture and keeping that leaves in suspension really adds to that. But it has to be something that you do carefully. It's not something that I will do on every batch. So I taste each wine every week and then decide, oh, I think this needs a bit more. Uh, and then we'll stir it up again. So there's no hard or fast rule for this. Uh, it is really a gut feel in, in the moment. Um, yeah, and then the, the components are blended together. And this was, was wattled early, early in this year only. So it really had beautiful tank maturation, um, which really allowed this wine to settle beautifully. And I, I'm, I'm quite happy with how this, is, how, with how this has come out. Yeah, I can I can second that. Um, <laughs> while we while while we um, uh, uh, get ready to move on to to some of the questions and uh, digest the information, I did want to ask also. Um, we're very curious to to hear your thoughts on the new packaging. Um, whether you feel it's an improvement, and uh, we we love it. Um, obviously, otherwise we wouldn't have done it. <laughs> but um, yeah, your your thoughts are. Very welcome. There was a question also earlier that I skipped, which was um, the altitude difference between the lowest and the yes. highest blocks, specifically the Chardonnay and the Simeon you were talking about. Yeah, so um, so the, the gate to Saxemburg is at about just under 100 meters elevation, so we're at about 90 meters, the Porco Dry Road that passes in front of us. And then the highest, the, the Semior, the top part of the Semior is planted at 280 meters. Uh, the, the uppermost uh, Sauvignon Blanc is around 260 to 270. Uh, and the Chardonnay uh, down here is at around about 110, 120 meters above elevation. So there's, there's quite a rise in elevation. Um, and that, that makes such a cru crucial difference. Um, and combined with the soils that are quite varied on the farm as well, it makes a beautiful difference as well. There's, I mean, this Sauvignon Blanc is is basically all from decomposed granite. A small section, that, that lower block, a portion of that is actually on Table Mountain sandstone. Um, so that also adds to the bit of difference that that block brings um, to my blend and why that block is so important in the blend. All right, we've got a lot of questions here, so we're <laughs> yeah. going to jump right in. Um, I see a lot of people are saying that they're very pleased with the dark glass on these bottles. So delighted right. to hear that. We think it looks very good as well. Um, please, can you explain the importance of screw cap versus cork? Um, maybe you want to spend, what, what I would recommend for anyone is, is actually Dirk has done a <laughs> phenomenal webinar on this. So if you go on to um, the Saxonburg YouTube channel, Saxonburg Wine Estate, you'll find an hour long webinar on the different types of closures and things, mm -hmm. which um, 
Um, but maybe you want we'll, to just talk two minutes about I'll touch on a second. Yeah. Um, so on, on Sauvignon Blanc, some of your main, uh, main uh, aroma compounds are called thiols. Uh, and thiols are very easily oxidizable. So they really oxidize out so quickly. Um, so with that, that's why you treat the Sauvignon Blanc grapes as they're coming to the winery and the wine at all stages, you treat as reductively as possible almost. So you use a blanket of CO2 or dry ice. Um, and what we actually do a little bit differently, we, um, you know, to be more environmentally friendly, I would like to think we, we actually capture our, the CO2 from our fermenting tanks and we've got a pipe that leads the, to our crusher and, and to the tanks that we're filling into. Um, so we're, we, we're just reusing all the CO2 that we're generating from, from fermentation. So we're not buying in a lot of CO2, um, but it's really to, to keep all those aromas um, because they oxidize so easily. And then the wines can become a bit bland and, and uncharacterful. So, so on this, the screw cap is you know, completely sealed. So there's no oxygen coming into it. With cork, there's always that slow uh, amount of oxygen coming into the wine, which is great, especially for barrel aged wines that you want you know, to develop, um, that you want to create this, the texture and all of that. So when you're blank, you, you want to almost keep it a little bit fresher for longer. You know, I mean, on a, from a consumer point of view, a lot of consumers, I've got friends that phone me up, well, basically this time of the year, and they're like, oh, is your, is your new Sauvignon Blanc bottled yet? And I'm like, cringe, <laughs> because, but, but the consumer wants to, you know, taste Sauvignon that's fresh and, and, and bright. Um, so I think for, for the style of wine, it, it's important to, you know, to, to keep that freshness. I, I bring in texture before I bottle it. I, I don't want it to develop too much in, in the bottle. This is, this, I assure you, this is not a commercial break, but <laughs> we did one of the, the first things. So we, we, we actually did together was taste through the Vinitec uh, uh, wines that we have here. So we lined up 30 vintages of, of wines and tasted through them. And uh, Dirk had uh, pulled a bottle of 92 yeah, so Sauvignon Blanc. Blanc. Yeah, and uh, well, you tell them what it tastes like. Well, I was uh, we so I discovered this this palette of or uh, not not a palette uh, a palette with a few different wines on, and there was a case of of ninety two Sauvignon Blanc on it, and it looked at the and the, the wine had quite a bit of an of eyelage, um, so just just below the neck or to the neck almost, um, but it was still beautifully clear. So I thought, well. Let's, let's take the chance, put it in the fridge, and we opened the bottle. The cork came out quite nicely, actually. It was completely soaked, um, but it was still intact. And the wine was magnificent. I mean, it's 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 not fresh Sauvignon Blanc, obviously, but it still had some fruit. Great food wine. Yeah, actually, yeah, beautiful caramel notes to it, beautiful texture and richness and this golden color. Um, and it, and I've actually, we've opened two, two bottles now, and both of them were fantastic. So if... If you do visit the farm, you, you might be able to twist the arm, but probably not. But don't make, promise, don't make promises we can't keep. We're doing well. <laughs> um, Kristen, uh, hello. Great to have you as well. She's asking whether you uh, inoculate. On, on the Sauvignon Blanc, yes, I do. Um, so on, on a lot of stuff, especially last year, because of my first vintage, I, I inoculated on, on, on most of my ferments. Um, this year, I'm doing a lot more spontaneous because... You kind of need to you need to feel the cellar out and, and, and you need to to know the, the native yeast strains that you have in the cellar. So I didn't go too much natural in the first year. But on the Sauvignon Blanc, it's, it's all inoculated. Um, and I really try and select yeast strains that, that bring out that I feel will bring out each block's uh, characteristics. So it's really I try and make these wines as individual as possible. They don't have to be perfect on their own, um, but they need to fit the puzzle of, of the final wine and, and really work together to make, make the final blend more special. Uh, then the, well, so in general, I think everyone's loving the new packaging, which is very encouraging. Thank you. Um, Fred is asking, is there a splash of any other variety in here? No, this is 100% Sauvignon Blanc, Fred. Yes, that's, we can do this, just thinking how impressive the finish is, yeah. So, I mean, th this topic often comes up, I, I think the, the, the Sauvignon Blanc also for us, um, obviously you don't have to wait uh, 20, 20 years uh, to drink it. Um, and we kind of obviously, you know, have to follow the market on this as well. People want it young and fresh, um, but we don't shy away from, from, you know, even releasing it now because, you know, you, you're all tasting it and uh, we think it's, we think it's, it's perfect now. So um, very excited that uh, you guys are also enjoying it. Great, John. I think on, on that, 
uh, that the finish thanks thanks for that comment i re i really appreciate that because that is for me such an important part you know sonia blank a lot of time gets gets a, a lot of you know it's a very a lot of consumers like it but when you when you speak gen it's tend to speak to, yeah. yeah when you speak to more wine geeky people they're like oh sonia blank no no thank you i, I don't drink sonia blank and it's because it can be so one dimensional you know, and that's I think the part where it's it's easy to understand for a lot of consumers, and that's why they like it. But as it, as you get into wine more, you start looking for more nuance and more textures and more uh, more depth in wine. And then Sauvignon Blanc is sometimes a little bit one dimensional. Um, so that's why it's so important for me to really you know create texture, um, to, to create layers, and and to make a blend and not just one tank of of, of Sauvignon Blanc, but to really put these things together to create those layers and to create those textures and to really pull that finish um, all the way to the back um, is for me personally very important because otherwise it's just a little bit too simple. Um, okay, uh, let's see if there are some different expressions of swing by and I say I'm starting to convert. Great, <laughs> great, great. Right. delighted to hear it. Another convertee. <laughs> um, Fantastic. Are we going to go over to, to the next one? Any more questions on the song? No, I think that's it. And otherwise we'll, we'll look at those in a minute. Um, so if if I may, what is the, uh, 120 rand is the retail price, 120 rand on shelf. Um, I'm just going to grab this very quick right. um, introduction for to this wine. So this is the one um, uh, that we will be tasting next, and um, this is the this is currently um, a very limited release within our private collection range. Um, and the thought for this wine was actually born many, many, many years ago when the thought was to create a pendant to the, uh, to the red flagship wine, the Saxonburg Shiraz Select. Um, and hence the triple S was going to be repeated in the Saxonburg Sauvignon Blanc Semillon. Um, we attempted that uh, back in with the 2011 vintage. And um, although the wine is still available today, and I think it's, it's actually showing drinking, beautifully now, showing yeah. beautifully, and it's actually aged um, mm -hmm. very well, we decided that we weren't actually going to um, uh, produce a, a white at that level and, and just reserve the, the top spot on the podium to a Syrah and, and leave it that way. But uh, I think we, we enjoyed the, the product and we enjoyed the result and, and customers seem to be enjoying it as well. And so we've decided that in some of the very good years, we're going to produce another one. And uh, that's what Doak has done now almost 10 years later with the 2020 vintage. Yeah, so we've got a, a small, I mean, Thank half. It's, it's just about half a hectare of, of semi oil right at the top. Like I said, the highest part of the block is, is 280 meters. Um, so it's a very cool block. It, it heals everything, any, anything from between a thousand to about a thousand five hundred liters in total. So it's really a, a, a tiny little block. Um, and yeah, you go to, yeah. you'll you'll see it there. And then so that was I, I crash crash into well not destemmed I don't well destemmed not crash sorry I don't we don't I've removed the crasher completely. Um, but destem it received skin contact for an hour or two, and then it was lightly pressed and transferred to, to all, everything was in all the barrels. And like I said, with the, the winemaker's blend, these components, all of those semi-oil barrels, um, they were left on the leaves without sulfur for the 10 rats. Um, and it really allowed that wine to develop quite a bit. Um, it did through, go through malolactic as well, which dropped the acidity quite a bit, but which added to the richness. Um, but because I think what it's so important, you know, sometimes people shy away from malolactic um, and sometimes rightfully so because too much mallow can, you know, make the wine unbalanced. But mallow is also something that you need to manage carefully um, and directly with, directly after malolactic fermentation, when it's when yeah, just as malolactic has completed, you get a lot of diacetyl, um, which is that, that battery aroma, which is quite can be quite off putting. Um, and if you, a lot of people sulfur up immediately after malolactic because they want to keep the wine safe. Um, but then you capture all of that diacetyl and all of those battery aromas, which is then very dominating. Um, but if you actually leave it without sulfur after that, you just keep the barrel topped and you keep everything healthy, that diacetyl starts to break down because it's quite susceptible to oxygen. So the oxygen that comes into the barrel over time, you know, breaks that diacetyl down and then the fruit starts coming to the fore. So then you've created the texture from the malolactic fermentation, but you don't have, have any of the batteriness, um, which is something that I, I look for quite a bit. 
Um, so that's the semio, um, but by far the largest component here is Sauvignon Blanc. And it's two barrels. I use two two barrels of Sauvignon Blanc on this. Like Vincent said, it's a it's a quite a limited release and, and quite a small bottling, which did about a, a thousand two hundred odd bottles of this. Um, and the two barrels were one was inoculated and the one was a natural ferment. Uh, so, like I said, I, I I felt it out on the natural ferments last year just to to see where they go, and it, and it actually worked very beautifully. Um, it created that the natural ferment had lovely texture to it. So they were also in barrel for 10 months, but it's all older. So none of the wines that we've tasted now have any, any new barrels on it. Um, so it's all older oak just to create texture, um, which, is, which is really important. And yeah, this was bottled uh, towards the end, end of last year. Um, so, you know, I think some of your semi is such a, such a beautiful blend because you get, get that minerality and that freshness from the Sauvignon Blanc and you'll see the blocks um, is right at the top, the Sauvignon Blanc that we use for this. So right at the top, very cool blocks. They, gives, they give us beautiful acidities, a lot of those greener flavors as well. Um, and then the semi is right from right next to it as well. So, and that, that semi oil, you get, you get that beautiful waxiness already coming through from, from the semi oil. It's a good almost counterpoint to, to the Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and this wine, I must say, has developed a lot now. We, we spoke about the development of glass from the winemaker's blend. I think this one would actually do well with the decanting before before serving it because it opens up so beautifully. Yeah, I mean, we've tasted this wine uh, nonstop since what, January uh, mm -hmm. now, and uh, we must have tasted five, six, seven times already. And uh, you know, obviously, we're excited to to release it, but you know, in, in all honesty, this is a wine that will do well with either decanting or um, you know, a bit more maturation time, um, but I think will be incredibly rewarding. Yeah. The, the Sauvignon component is, is very strong, obviously, the Saxon Sauvignon, as you tasted on the wine before, extremely expressive, um, and, and this personally is, is one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite blends. Um, I, think, I think it's stunning, it's elegant, they're beautiful examples that we kind of used mm -hmm. as inspiration in South Africa of great uh, garb expressions, yeah. and uh, and yeah, so now we are we are ready for your comments. <laughs> I see that quite a few comments. So Michael says, tasted the 2011 this morning. It's quite exceptional, opulent, aromatic. And I hope you don't mind me reading this out and on the front <laughs> of the palate and then remarkably fresh on the finish. Um, thank you, Michael. Yeah, we um, we were also uh, actually surprised, to be honest, uh, happily surprised. <laughs> And, um, and, you know, felt like this is definitely something that's got legs and wanted to reproduce it. So we'll see how this does for the next 10 years. I don't think there'll be any around in 10 years, to be <laughs> honest. We'll have to, the, the, the production of the 2011 was significantly bigger than, yeah. than what this is um, uh, today. So uh, let's see. So Barry says the mouthfeel, oops, just lost it. The mouthfeel on this one is exceptional. You certainly achieved texture. Right, thanks Barry. Thank you. Um, then we've got, I think Andrea is kindly sharing the prices, prices as we get those questions. And what we can do is we can circulate at the end of it, just in an email as well, the, uh, the updated uh, um, um, sort of recommended retail price. This wine will integrate magnificently. This is one of my favorite blends. And this one is a superb example. Thank you, Fred. Uh, and then price of the... Okay, now we're moving quickly. <laughs> 2011, absolute favorite. So excited for what this wine will do after a bit of aging. We agree. Yeah. Malu built. To, uh, Malu, nice to have you. Nice to see you there as well. Built to last. Yeah. Great, thanks, Malu. Yeah, I think. And I'm, I must say, I'm, I'm very excited of, of, about the 2021 vintage as well. I've, I've put a few more components. So I put a few more blocks of the Sauvignon in in barrel um, to see how they how they would shape and and with the incredible acidities uh, we're getting. I think that's also going to be wines that will probably only be, be drunk in, in a few years time um, because it's, it's just going to be so, you know, keep, keep its freshness so much. Um, so it, it's, hope, it's definitely a wine that I, I want to work on and, and explore more and, and try and push the envelope. I think with, with the winemaker's blend and, and, and this limited release, it really gives me the opportunity to push the envelope a little bit uh, and not just you know fit in the mold um, but 
but but really try and experiment and and, and always try and uh, outdo myself almost and, and really showcase because at the end of the day it's all about showcasing the farm i mean it's if, if ask anyone that's that's taken a, a drive up saxonburg it really is inspiring um and it's, it's such a wonderful property so uh, the challenge for me is just to try and showcase that in a, in a glass of wine as, as much as i can and hopefully try and do it justice Absolutely. Well, who knows? Maybe uh, Project Triple S White is, <laughs> is not dead just yet. <laughs> we, we'll see. You might be able to revive it. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. Okay. If we have no further questions, then um, we do. Caroline says it's a complex, delicious wine with perfect balance. The rich of the simian has good presence. However, I would prefer to have it a slightly drier finish next time where possible. Um, I completely understand that, uh, Caroline, and that was was something actually that I that I looked at as well when blending it. Um, but that is, like, it, I mean, like I said, it, it's a it's a bit of a showcase of the vintage and 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 of of the year and all of that um, and of the terroir. So, but it is something I'm I'm playing around with with picking at different ripeness levels and the the components that I'm taking to barrel this. It's much more spread out this year. Um, so. You know, try and build in that bit of clarity right at the back of the palate. I think would, would probably be do the wine good. Um, then Michael has asked whether you could share the RS of all these wines. Um, yeah, let me just have a look. I think they're on 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 the tasting notes that you guys had. Sorry, I'm terrible with re remember with remember re remembering analysis uh, because I'm I'm such a a gut field <laughs> type of winemaker, so I forget forget blend percentages and analysis quite quickly. I have rough ideas. Um, the winemaker's blend is, is just over three grams, um, and then the Sauvignon Blanc I think is just over two just over two grams per liter, and then the Sauv Sem is over three just over three and a half as well. Um, so there is a bit of RS on it, um, but, but it definitely I think it, it comes down to personal taste on on that as well. All right, Barry, but would the normal consumer want it? Okay, we'll let you two um, have that one out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so on that note, and if there, there we go. Okay, that's settled. Cool. Um, yeah. So on to the last wine, um, which is the Chardonnay 2019. Also to be released, so all these wines are to be released um, on the 25th of March. Yeah, so um, the Chardonnay, so this is this is the only one that I, I didn't make, uh, well, not completely. I, I didn't, wasn't part of the fermentation, obviously. I, I put the blend together, um, which was, I must say, Edwin fortunately gave me quite an easy task. It's always stressful when you get to a new winery and there's, the winery is full of wine, and you're hoping that the wine in barrel is, is any good because you have to still you have to work through those before you get to your own wines um and unfortunately i mean it was a fantastic job and i was left with a cellar full of, of great wines and and the chardonnay is case in point i think so uh, this is we go to the maps quickly yes yeah. so we've got we've got the one block of chardonnay right at the bottom in the parking area that we used uh, for the winemakers blend um, but this 2019 Chardonnay is, is actually a blend of our two main blocks. Um, so the one is called Kral, and the other one is our, our younger block. So the Kral block was planted in the 90s, uh, and then the younger block was planted in 2012. This is predominantly from the Kral vineyard, so that, that is the lower one or the one to the left on, on, the, on the map there. Um, it's predominantly from that, and at, that block is entirely decomposed granite with a lot of coffee clip in between as well. And then there's portions that we're starting to use or some barrels of the younger block, you know, the, the, the block is, is, is starting to hit its stride now and starting to make it in, into the final blend, which is really exciting. Um, it, it yielded beautifully this year and the fruit looked phenomenal. So I'm, I'm happy with where that block is, is heading. If you go to the next one, Vincent, just to, to see, uh, so you'll see that it's, it's not the cooler site. It's not the cooler site on the farm. It's got Quite a quite a bit of radiation, but that there is that side of the of the younger block um, that is definitely much much cooler, and they're quite unique and quite different the two blocks. Um, and this is all this is all destemmed and then went straight to barrel and and fermented in, in barrel and was 
left in barrel for 11 months. There's only 10% new oak on it. So we've changed, or well, they changed, but I can't say we, it was done before I got here. So since I think 2016 or 17, um, all the new oak that was bought for this wine has been 500 liter French oak barrels. Yep. Um, so the larger format obviously imparts less oak flavors to the wine and it's all blonde or light toasting. So very, very light toasting. And it's really, the oak must play a background role in, in the wine. You know, you don't want to, I don't want to smell the wine and just smell oak. Um, that, that's not showcasing Saxon that's just showcasing a forest in France. So, so for me, the oak must really just, there. It, it's a, it, it just helps the wine. It just rounds it out that little bit. Um, there's, a, there's a funny story on the, on the, <laughs> on the barrels of this, however, because as much as there is less oak now, um, even before Dirk had signed his contract here yeah. in Saxonburg, he felt the need to send me um, a shopping list, which I thought was a Christmas list, a Christmas wish list for less barrels, but significantly better barrels. I think biggest, uh, biggest barrel invoice uh, in Saxonburg history. So, um, but hopefully reflective. So we'll be seeing that in the 2020. In the, in yeah. the 2020 vintage, yeah. So I, I was uh, about a month out from starting at Saxonburg. And um, one of the one of the barrel suppliers actually phoned me up and said, "Oh, I hear you're the new winemaker. Congrats! You know, do you want some barrels?" And I was like, "Well, uh, I don't actually know yet." Um, <laughs> so I I sent Vin, oh, I, I phoned Vincent up and I said to him, "Listen, um, can I get two bottles of well, the you know, can I get some of some of the a, a few vintages of the Chardonnay? I just want to see what I'm working with and and then you know interpret that and, and think of what barrels would work well with it and then." Yeah, I, you know, sometimes the better, the, the more expensive barrels are the better ones. <laughs> so I, I took quite a bit of a, a leap of faith on, on that one before I even started. Um, but yeah, that's that that will come out next year in, in the 2020, and I'm I'm very excited about that wine. But we we'll, we won't talk about that yet. No, no, no. We'll we'll talk about that next year. Um, but yeah, this was so like I said, 11 months in barrel. Um, a portion went through malolactic. I, I I'm not exactly. I'm not sure of the exact percentages here as i said i mean i didn't i i wasn't part of this wine for most of its life in, in barrel um but there is definitely a portion that went through mallow and it's i think the the chardonnays that we get on saxonburg is, is quite unique as well um it, it's like all of the all of the whites a little bit removed from the typical salamosh uh whites so that for me you know creates interest and it's 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 definitely something special so um let's go on to some questions um maybe before we jump directly into the questions um we've been showing a lot of these uh, maps and talking about plantings and replantings um and, and this is this has been one of the certainly more or most exciting uh, i think topics of conversation at saxonburg um between Doug and myself as well and donovan our viticulturist um is to to kind of understand you know what is it? What data do we have to work with? And these GIS studies are a great start um, because ultimately our goal really is is to farm much more sustainably. Um, and it's not just a word we want to throw out there. It's not just something that we necessarily want to put into our um, marketing um, sheets and presentations. The reality is, as we were told yesterday, we had a fascinating yeah. visit by a guy called um, Francis Yateman, uh, who's worked in this field for. I don't want to, I've been 33 more, decades yeah. and uh, who really opened our, our eyes to it, that it's, it, it is a fairly, it is a very doable journey. It is a very, very realistic task. And as he says, things shouldn't be farmed regeneratively at the moment. It's just that we have, um, I think he used the effed it up word yeah. <laughs> for the last 300 years. And we now need to fix it. We just need to farm properly. Um, so we, we're very excited about what we're doing in the vineyards at the moment as well. Uh, we see this as a chance, uh, you know, we've obviously had, like many others, uh, problems with uh, leaf roll, uh, which we are um, getting a handle on. We've ripped out most of the, the, the badly infected uh, vineyards, we've replanted a lot, we've sought an opportunity to really plant the stuff that we want, the clones that we want, the rootstocks that we want, in the areas that we want. Uh, so we take 30 years of, of kind of track record and then we say, well, okay, where are we going to plant this next? And um, so that's that's been an incredibly exciting uh, journey, yeah. I think, and and joined with the chapter of sustainability. Uh, you know, we we firmly believe it's going to make an, a huge difference 
uh, in the grapes that we will be harvesting um, in the next uh, 10 years here at Saxonburg. And obviously that's very exciting. Yeah, definitely. I think Vincent, maybe on, on the replanting, maybe just go back to the solar yeah. radiation map quickly. We, we've got a very exciting block of Chardonnay uh, planned uh, and that will be planted, uh, planted next year. So um, yeah, if you, if you look at the map where the cursor is, oh, uh, Vincent, I've lost your cursor, sorry. <laughs> Um, response to my so, search yeah so where the cursor is a little bit down 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 so right there where that cursor is just below that block um you can see that's a very cool spot it's it's a south facing spot it, it's very weakly decomposed granite soils there um and that's our new going to be our new chardonnay planting so it's a, it's about a three three hectare block that we're going to plant there on the cooler site if you go actually to the next slide to site um, slide will to the daylight hours. You can also see that on that, that green section there, that is the least amount of daylight basically on, on Saxonburg as well. So it's a block that's not going to receive a lot of energy from the sun and it's not going to have a lot of time of sun, hours of sunshine as well. So it's going to be quite a slow ripening block, but I think it's going to bring such a beautiful dimension to our current um, Chardonnay, which I'm really excited about. And it's, and it's one, one of those sites that you know, you walk onto it and as a winemaker, you start getting this tingling down your spine of excitement. You're like, I can't wait to work with this fruit. And unfortunately, I still have to wait quite a few years to work with it, but it's it's really exciting. And and I think as, as Vincent said with sustainability as well, it's really something that I think we're we're all very passionate about. And it's not something, you know, that it's not for the marketing side of, of oh, we're sustainable. Um, it's just really, I've, I've worked in vineyards for, for a while. I grew up in between vineyards and I've worked professionally in vineyards for the last, what, nine, 10 years almost. And, you know, and I, and I worked, I got exposed to a lot of vineyards all around the Western Cape. And, and you can walk into certain vineyards where there are multi-species cover crops planted, you know, where it's not everything isn't sprayed to death and all of that. And, it, and you can feel the life in the block. Um, you know that everything feels healthier everything feels more complete um, and that you know those those blocks are more buffered against disease they're they're more consistent year in and year out and I, I, I truly I think we truly believe that that is the way forward um, and it's and it's not something that you just do because it's a nice to do I think it's something that we all just have to do there's, yeah. <laughs> there's like like Francis put it yesterday it's just it's not about recreating the wheel. It's actually just going back to the basics of farming properly. Um, we we all you know everyone went into the wrong mindset because we we found shortcuts it's like taking pain pills every day. You're not really fixing your problem of getting headaches. You're just uh, treating the 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 symptom. Um, so we should I think in farming get away from treating the symptoms and and really taking care of our soils because those are. The most important part so that's a very exciting i think it's a very exciting chapter in in saxonburg's um future and and, and saxonburg as a whole and hopefully you know that will help us take the wines to to a whole different level um yeah yeah 100 percent. i um you know if anything uh, if we could have started this 10 years ago it would have been even better it's always the case but we are we're really trying to do our homework at the moment for, for anyone who's going to join us on Saturday, we've got a webinar at 10 a.m. in the morning between Dirk um, and a uh, gentleman called uh, Dick Richardson, originally South African and now based in Western Australia. And we'll be asking him a lot of questions and we really wanted to share this with uh, our colleagues and anyone interested in the industry as well. We'll be asking all those questions which we thought wineries would ask themselves. Um, you know, what is the approach? What is going to make a difference? Um, the fact that it does make it make a difference is is undisputable. But uh, so you know, if anyone is around and has the time, do join us for that. Um, we we actually got invited tonight as well. We we're attending the uh, webinar hosted by the Jackson Family Winery uh, in the states, and they're going to give a webinar on uh, on their practices as well and the results that they've seen from their more sustainable approaches. So it's um, it's very exciting. Yeah. But um, back to your uh, questions. So we have now finished the tasting and we'll look at the questions here. Are we going back? We are, oh no. So the percentage, so Angela said, the percentage of Simeon is higher than many other similar blends. Maybe its richness accentuates the slightly sweet finish, which, um, well, will you change the percentage of blend from vintage to vintage? Um, 
Yes and no. Well, I, I, it, it really depends on the vintage. Um, so I, I don't like blending to a certain percentage. I, I look at my components that I have on the table and take it from there. Um, so if it comes out as being less semi in the future or more semi I, I I don't have a preference about that. It's For me, it's really about creating balance in the wine. And every vintage I feel will, will be different. Um, and maybe with the massive acidities that we're having in, in 2021, more, even more senior maybe would, would be justified to round that, that, that acidity off, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, so there's no rule, there's no recipe for that. Um, so I think everyone's appreciating your new oak, <laughs> or the idea of new oak, everyone's excited. Barry did have a barrel tasting, so, I'm glad he approves as well. And then please could, we also know the retail price of both the Sauvignon Semillon and the Chardonnay respectively. Yes, it's uh, 185 uh, and then the Chardonnay is 225. Um, and that is, yes, but we'll circulate those prices as well. That's always retail. All these wines, a tale of texture. Thanks, thanks, Malu. Thank you, Malu. That's um, I, I, I quite, in, I quite appreciate that comment because it is something that I have for a lot of my winemaking. I think, um, you know, I, I feel aromas are something that you, you either have it or you don't. There's, um, you know, you can, you can try and tweak it, but that becomes at, at some point it almost becomes artificial. Uh, so for me, the real skill is, is to bring in texture and, and balance into wines. Uh, so it's great that that you picked up the texture. Um, Michael says the maps have been very useful. Um, yes, well, glad they were. Uh, they certainly are for us as well. Yeah. Uh, in so many ways and informing our decisions. Bravo, Dirk, first on your first collection of wines, seconded. Noted, Andrea. Um, love this lineup. I'm excited to see what the approach to Oaking will deliver in future. Thank you, Brent, um, joining us. Um, I'm not sure where you are in the world at the moment, but it's uh, it's really wonderful to have you on. And um, at this point, uh, thank you from all of us here at Saxonburg. Thank you for being part of uh, today, uh, being part of this release. I hope we could uh, convey how excited we are and, um, and that you um, enjoyed the wines. Uh, your time and your feedback and, um, and your opinion really means a lot to us. And hopefully as things normalize, we get to see more of all of you uh, this year still. Right. Uh, Francia, um, from the 2019, uh, the 2019s will be my blends. Um, so and then the 2020s will be made and, and blended by me so but from the 19s will yeah will be there'll be some input from my side at least we can talk about a singita pre-release or something maybe. <laughs> we'll bottle some spe as specific spe especially in magnums for you francois thank you thank you angela thank you everyone um and congratulations to to Dirk. absolutely thank you so much it was Great sharing it with, with everyone. If you've got any, any more questions, uh, yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, please just send us a mail, give us a call. I'm, I'm always open for a chat. So yeah, please find me up. Thank you everyone. And just, we will be sending um, retail prices and uh, around and obviously a thank you to all of you in an email. And then this recording will be up on our YouTube channel. Um, if you want to revisit anything and, and um, expand on your notes and otherwise, obviously, you know where to find Dirk. He is here to answer all your questions, maybe a little bit delayed uh, <laughs> over the next few yeah. months, but, uh, but we, we are here for you. So thank you so much. Almost as late, but it's not two months, two months anymore. It's no, only no, about three months. weeks. Three only. weeks, that's right. Three, that's three right. to four weeks. I was, to, I, was, I was trying to buy you some time. Thanks, but you were working in my leave or something after. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank